वेलकम टू द फिफ्टींथ एडिशन ऑफ जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल प्रोटेक्टेड बाय डेटॉल बनेगा स्वस्थ इंडिया एट बैंक ऑफ बड़ौदा मुगल टेंट वी आर डिलाइटेड टू इंट्रोड्यूस बांग्लादेश द बांग्लादेश वेव द सेशन इज प्रेजेंटेड बाय साकाल मीडिया ग्रुप कोमेमोरेटिंग द फिफ्टी ईयर्स ऑफ बांग्लादेश लिबरेशन वो दिस सेशन लुक्स एट द रिलेशन बिटवीन इंडिया एंड बांग्लादेश एंड एग्जामिन्स the social political cultural and economic way forward to fuel and support the rich diversity of both the neighboring countries we have uh, on the panel pinak ranjan chakravarti i'll request you to come on stage sir who served twice in bangladesh first as deputy high commissioner and later as high commissioner to bangladesh he also served as secretary in the ministry of external affairs chakravarti is a visiting fellow at the observer research foundation and founder director of deep strat a new think tank mehfooz anam so can you please come on board is the co-founder of the daily star bangladesh's leading english daily and is its editor publisher from 1993 till date Uh, he was a member of the Mukti Bahini and trained by the Indian Army at Murthy, West Bengal. Shudip Chakravarti is a leading commentator on business and human rights. He is the author of The Eastern Gate, War and Peace in Nagaland, Manipur, and India's Far East, and several other works of non-fiction. The session will be moderated by Sudha Sadanand, who spent more than three decades in various fields of mainstream media and allied streams such as publishing, radio documentary, radio documentaries, and TV news. While with Penguin, she edited works of authors such as Pugul Jaikar and Professor Bipin Chandra. Her last stint was with Bestland Amazon, where she led their non-fiction list and edited Pawan Verma and Veer Sangvi. amongst others sadanand is president editor editorial affairs at india ahit over to you thank you this light is too strong it's a bit much it's falling right into my eye do something can we can i do something for it it's it's very both those or else i then have to sit like this ओके गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी नमस्कार आदाब वेरी नाइस टू हैव ऑल ऑफ यू हियर एंड दिस इज अ वेरी वेरी स्पेशल सेशन आई हैड सेवरल सेशंस बट दिस वाज वेरी कीनली अवेटेड बाय मी दैट्स बिकॉज आई एम अ तमिल बट आई एम अ सेल्फ डॉट बेंगाली इट्स अ को इंसिडेंस नो बॉयफ्रेंड्स नो लवर्स पेरेंट्स हस्बैंड नो but i speak bengali like fluently and no one knows why so i guess there is a connection so i'm very happy to be here it's like being amongst friends so let's start the session uh you know i'm going to cover both the cultural because shudeep is here i've read his book so both the cultural aspects as well as the political aspects and i don't like the political aspect very much i'm not very comfortable with it because there are uncomfortable questions uh but the point is that i want to start with uh, something you know as a nasad bengali the one recurrent debate i have heard is about food you know i'm yet to meet a bengali who's not passionate about food look at all your faces you're all smiling already deciding what to have for dinner like you know i have been with friends and they would be having lunch and they would say ratri ki khabo amra so that's the first yes yes they would start deciding on food and one thing which i have seen and they've been you know uh, people have been uh, people have joked about it but i've also seen fisticuffs the bangal food and the goti food you know the food from that side look at those smiles again pinak is smiling away so uh, can we start with this conversation for those who do not know bangal food i mean loosely translated is food from bangladesh and goti food is what 
this side, that is West Bengal, eats. And there have been very, very serious fights about you are superior, I am inferior, you do not know, my mom did this. So I want to start with food because I think Bengalis love food and you know we should straight away, all of you turn by turn. Shudhi, your turn first. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, but I think we've sort of been there and done that in a way. So I'm not thinking ahead to dinner. I'm actually thinking ahead to tomorrow's lunch, uh, <laughs> if you want me to think. And you know, it's not Bangladeshi food. It's sort of I would I would sort of gently intervene here or interject and perhaps fine tune it a little by saying East Bengali food yeah. and not East Bengali food. Let me just make that there is no West Bengali food in a way in in that sense. There, there are many regions of Bengal which people don't realize. It's not just about the east and west. It's about the south, which we forget. It's about the north and the northeast and the southwest and the north, you know, northwest as well. So it's, it's a regional thing. I think the food is sort of a, it's a done deal. There is no debate about the fact that we, yes, we love our cuisine and we think it's the best in the world. Uh, and, and I think uh, there would be arguments, but, uh, you know, it's just like splitting hairs among Bengalis, and I think uh, we'd rather do it amongst ourselves than in front of an audience that may not actually appreciate the nuances of the hairs we are splitting. No, it's, it's so, not, you know, yeah. I think we should let it rest. I, I'm sorry, but one of the, one of the card-carrying privileges of being a Bengali is also to decide for the moderator and the chair what he or she should decide this. So I'm just sort of yeah, cutting I, in I, here I, and I, saying, no, I, let's I, move I, away. I'm and let's not, talk no, no, about, no, no, you know, can, the Bangladesh but, wave but, no, no, I and, can. you know, the we East Bengali thing. Sure, and we East can move away. Yeah. But food is a very integral part of any culture, any civilization. But you we are cultured, so we can move on. So, yeah, sure. We are You're very done. cultured. You're done. So uh, I want to ask you, Mahfouz, that... Uh, how much does food form part uh, of the If you will permit culture? me, um, I'm a bit of a, I, since I'm a freedom fighter and this is on the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh, with your permission, I would like to concentrate on my country. And I would like to thank you all for, for first thank the JLF for, I think, organizing this event. I think Bangladesh is the only country whose 50th anniversary is being featured by JLF, so my grateful thanks. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and thanks to all of you who have endured the whole day to have come here. Uh, the reason I have shifted away from food is because I have very important things to communicate. India is our biggest, most important neighbor. Relationship with India is far, far more important for Bangladesh and I, think I would like to suggest for India, then it meets the eye. And at the, at the risk of sounding a little dramatic, I'm, since I'm a freedom fighter, I'm a personal witness to India's involvement in our war. The people of India, the government of India, the military of India, all of them I think we're at their finest hour, if I may borrow a Churchillian expression. I, I was in Agartala, I was in Kolkata, I was in many other cities of India at that time for reasons that I don't want to bore you with. But in each of these cities, the people were absolutely open-hearted in embracing us. I remember walking in the streets of Calcutta where in every private house, literally, there were Bangladeshi refugees, you know, <clears throat> staying there. And one thing I really have to take the occasion to say that the role of the Indian soldiers, 4,000 of them died for my country. And I would like to mention that when a soldier takes an oath, he or she takes an oath to defend their motherland. But the Indian soldiers laid down their lives to defend my motherland. And therefore, my gratitude is absolutely deep and enduring. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. And this is what I wanted to say. I'm sorry I moved no, away from okay. food, it's all but right. I couldn't it's have okay. done it unless this I is, did. This is about you. This is about, uh, so I'm just a moderator. Let's move on. He spoke about the wonderful relationship. So now let me dive straight into the India-Bangladesh relationship. Because I wanted to first, you want to say something, Pinak? Okay, so, you know, basically I wanted to, uh, you know, lay, as it were, the ground for it, but then if we want to straight away go into it, so be it. The recent, you know, we, when we saw the recent history of, you know, India's failure to deliver vaccines to Bangladesh, you know, it was 
a commercial deal that was a it was in place of course do you think that uh, it was of course spoken about but then also it was buried under it was like let's move on from here so i'm talking about recent history between bangladesh and india pinak do you think that impacted the relationship in any fact well let me first begin by saying that uh, indeed uh, the 50 years of bangladesh is a remarkable story from where bangladesh started and where it is today and that we can focus on later but since you asked about the vaccines let me say that we did we thought that we will be able to provide vaccines to all our neighbors and including other countries till date i think india has provided vaccines to more than 92 countries but then who knew about the second wave and the third wave and the paucity of vaccine uh, that would that would uh, descend upon us for our own people and any democratically elected government would would normally would would look after their own people and i i dare say that the commercially arranged contracts with bangladesh could not be fulfilled for this very reason but now i think we have moved on and i think uh, we are already supplying vaccines uh, as per i don't know whether it's a new contract or whatever but now we are in a more comfortable position that india has vaccinated almost 90% at least one vaccine and about 60 or 70% at least two vaccines so we are in a far more comfortable zone today and i think india will be supplying vaccines to many countries yeah. there are a lot of orders coming in so did it impact on the relationship momentarily yes because it was disappointment for yes. the for the bangladesh government because they were very Uh, dependent on india is the largest producer of vaccines in the world right. and we are the vaccine suppliers to the world so, but yes there was a, a, a little disappointment but let me also add here that the relationship cannot be disturbed by one small event or one small little uh, little irritant at a particular time it's far too deep and fundamental it is so uh, i just want to bring you in here sudeep that like Pinak was saying that this, it was a little disturbance, but then we are still living in the time of the pandemic and a time, you know, when the vaccines were very, very vital for everybody. At that time, if you may recall, China decided to get its leg in. So the whole kind of bonhomi or the friendship between Bangladesh and China, even if it is superficial, do you think that's a, you know, that's a bit of a problem for the relationship at large? Well, I think uh, I think the gentleman here would agree. the china would like to get its leg in, in anywhere and wherever wherever it can and whenever it can anywhere in the world so it's not like particular to uh india vis-a-vis -vis bangladesh and india vis-a-vis -vis anywhere uh we have our golden necklace approach to the string of pearls approach if, as it were but it's not as good as as effective as theirs but we try uh and here when i say we i mean i mean india as a country i don't mean to speak for the government of india not for a moment uh but as an observer of what's going on i think the the vaccine situation is uh maybe the latest um uh, sort of a ripple if you will in in the sort of uh, this placid lake as we like to describe with indo bangla relations which is actually not true it's quite a quite an active little lake a little pond that we have going uh and it's not just been the vaccine there've been other issues as well uh in fact uh, a very senior minister in government uh spoke not too long ago about a certain species uh, of insect called white ants uh and that led to a lot of ripples and very senior diplomats had to rush to dhaka to make sort of peace overtures with the government of bangladesh so this i think been uh domestic political compulsions which have led to statements which have led to reactions to our very friendly neighbor but these are ripples uh, sort of which hide other deeper connections even beyond which i think we've come from 1971 to a more mature relationship i personally believe that it's well beyond the sell by date for india to keep harping on the fact it's very gracious of mehfooz bhai to say what he did just now but i think for india uh to now get to a stage to sort of keep saying that we help bangladesh i think is well past the sell by date and we should move on we should acknowledge bangladesh for what it is right now 50 years old uh a wanna be country ambitious aspirational trying to move ahead with one of the fastest growing economies in the world uh it was is the second largest garment export nation in the world it lost the status briefly to vietnam i'm told a month ago it's reclaimed or two months ago it reclaimed that slot um i've just come in from dhaka today oh. 
uh, I've flown in from Dhaka earlier this afternoon. And uh, that's not meant to be like a drama queen statement. I, I, I actually have. And I'm seeing this buzzed, buzzing, dynamic city, this huge metropolis of Dhaka, chaotic, but aspirational, sort of unapologetic, wants to get there. So that's the kind of Bangladesh I think we should acknowledge as a friendly neighbor, as a mature neighbor. We moved on from 71. We are now in 2020, uh, 2022. And here we have relationships which have matured. Uh, I'll give you a few examples because I write about that re part of the subcontinent. I deal with conflict and conflict resolution issues. I deal with um, uh, trade, investment, so on and so forth. I'll tell you what Bangladesh has done. We've been able to resolve, and uh, Ambassador Chakraborty will bear me out on this, just three, four years ago, this hugely problematic thing about enclaves that each country had in the other's territory. We've sorted it out in 2015, if I'm not wrong. Then, Bangladesh is single-handedly responsible for boosting transshipment of Indian products from Eastern India and even Vizag to Tripura, to, to Northeastern India, via Bangladesh, right? Uh, we are opening up trade routes with Bangladesh. We are opening up all kinds of things. There's investment flowing. There's Indian products in Bangladesh, Bangladeshi products in India. Uh, we've moved on. You know, this is an evolutionary process. I think we need to be acknowledging that when we're talking about a Bangladesh wave, which is the name of our title this evening. I think we, it is important to come at this discussion from that perspective and really contextualize, situate Bangladesh at 50. And while India is at 75, right. uh, you know, we were at the Bangladesh stage of growth not too long ago ourselves. So I think we should approach this respectfully. We should uh, approach this with acknowledgement, not overbearing uh, arrogance or overbearing paternalism that, you know, we liberated you. We are done with that. And I think Bangladesh is pretty much done Talk, with that yeah, as well. Yeah. So talking about that, you know, uh, uh, Mahfuz Saab, if I can you bring you in here because this is 50 years and, uh, you know, you were part of the war, as it were. Would you like to recall some moments, you know, because it is, it's been written about, maybe my generation has read a lot about it, but I think today is an evening to also recall that, you know, because that is, that is something that we all have to acknowledge at the end of the day, yeah. Well, uh, 71 was a, a period of dream, of energy, of enthusiasm, of courage, of sacrifice and in that whole if you were drama of events uh, india was our helping hand and we achieved our independence now it was a glorious moment i was a mukti bahini member and and i mean to, to us it was a dream come true chance to build shonar bangla now fast forwarding it today I would like to start off with the fact that Bangladesh m made all its, uh, if you like, uh, negative perceptions prove false. We are now, as Sudeep has said, and I'm glad that he said it rather than me, I would rather like to focus on the future. I think that <clears throat> truly India and Bangladesh can work together to set an example of what good neighbors can do to one another. What technology transfer, investment, and, uh, and also a shared dream of a peaceful, prosperous South Asia. Now, let us admit also, Pinak, you are part of the, um, you know the history, that yes, we began well. In the middle, there were lots of ups and downs in the relationship between India and Bangladesh, but now we are back on track. The point I would like to make is that let us not repeat the mistakes of the past that we made. Let us not fall back on the potential of this neighborly relationship. And to do that, I would like to suggest a few things. First of all, please try to understand Bangladesh. What do I mean by that? Now, Bangladesh is a secular country based on Bengali nationalism. But it is a Muslim majority country. Now, because of the majority, there are cultural aspects of, of Bangladesh which may not be, quote unquote, similar to, say, Bengali cultural aspects in West Bengal. But that is Bangladesh. Now, I would urge our Indian friends to distinguish between religiosity of the people and fundam fundamentalism of religious adherence. Now, every Bengali 
who goes to a mosque is not a fundamentalist. Or somebody keeping a beard is not somebody that you, know, you have to be sort of looking back on. These are religious-minded Bengali Muslims building a secular Bangladesh. Now, that is something you have to understand and respect. Secondly, we are now a growing economy. So the relationship bet between India and Bangladesh sh should be one of mutual assistance. Now, let me give you one example. The trade between Bangladesh and India, about six billion formal, and about another six, seven billion informal, which is smuggled. But the economy is about 11, 12 billion dollars. Right. Now, how many countries in the world does India have on a bilateral basis of, say, 11 to 12 billion dollars? And with a per capita income of 2,400, we have the potential of this trade relationship going into 20, 30 billion in the next decade or so. So that is the partnership we should be looking yeah. into. No favor, no patronization, yeah. but a partnership. And if we can build on that, we would need Indian technology, we would need Indian uh, investment. But at the same time, we would need a fairness in the trade relationship. In fact, sometimes a supportive hand from India in this trade relationship so that we both prosper. I would like to suggest that helping Bangladesh become prosperous neighbor is more to, I mean, is as much to Bangladesh's interest as it is to India. You would like to have a prosperous Bangladesh as a trading partner rather than, you know, any other Bangladesh. And this is quite possible. I would like to also suggest that as independent country and as a very friendly neighbor, we will definitely have a lot of similarity, but we will also have a lot of differences. Yes. As a friend, you must understand those differences and in fact respect those differences. Otherwise, we are not two independent yeah, yeah. countries. Absolutely. So that is where I feel that sometimes the relationship between India and Bangladesh is not really living up to its potential. So well said. Ambassador Chakraborty, I would like you to weigh in on this. You know, where uh, Mehfooz Saab said that, you know, the mistakes of the past, if there are three, I mean, whatever, I'm not going to list it out for you. What is it that we need to better, you know, I mean, geopolitically, even culturally, even as, you know, neighbors who have more similarities than most other neighbors that I see? Maybe I don't see enough, but then. With Bangladesh, I feel that, you know, there is seamlessness, so far as I'm concerned. So I just want you to weigh in on this, that the past mistakes, if we want to eclipse them or erase them, what would those be and how do we better it going forward? Well, we have certainly learned uh, lots of lessons from the past. And, uh, and that is why where we are today in India-Bangladesh relationships. And some of it was driven uh, by policies of the government of India and some by individuals uh, like me. You know, uh, if I may say so, because uh, I remember, and this is anecdotal, and okay. uh, I do not know how, I've never spoken about it in the public. In 2008, after the, the caretaker government uh, held the election, and which Awami League won with a thumping majority, and Sheikh Hasina came back to be prime minister again. But before she took office, I visited her. And uh, naturally, it was as a high commissioner, I spoke about our relationship. But I did ask her in the end that when would you like to visit Delhi? And what is it that uh, immediately that uh, we can be of any assistance? I mean, in, in a very spirit of mutual sort of, you know, helping each other. So she came, what she said, you know, really floored me. Because at that time, Bangladesh was suffering a lot of electricity cutbacks, what we call outages, you know, blackouts or whatever we call it. So she looked at me and smiled and said, High Commissioner, can you give me electricity? <laughs> Believe it or not, this is the truth. And so I said, uh, uh, Prime Minister, that uh, give me some time, I'll go and figure it out. Because how do you take electricity from one country to another if your grids are not connected? And how do you pass that electricity? So hence, that's when it all began to connect Bangladesh to the Indian grid, for example. Like Nepal is connected to, uh, and yes. Bhutan is connected. Today, I'm so happy to say that 1,200 megawatts of electricity from our national pool, Bangladesh gets about five, 
600 as a, at a concessional price, and the rest they buy from India, from the national pool. They have, we have a company which sells the electricity. Now, even the eastern part near Tripura, the grid has been connected because there is a huge uh, power plant, the Palatana power plant coming up there, and we will be able to you know, spare electricity. Look, this set off a trend of mutual assistance to each other. What did we want? We wanted some transit rights and, you know, uh, sell, uh, sending goods through, uh, say, from Calcutta to the northeast. Northeast remains a bit cut off, you know, from the mainstream of India. Then Bangladesh came and, and agreed that we could connect the, from Cox's Bazaar, the international internet gateway to Agartala, right. which we said we will fund through an optical fiber connection. So today the northeast gets faster internet because of Bangladesh. So there are a lot of these examples. I can go on and on for hours giving you. That. So the energy sector has been a great connector for us. And the other thing is that we are recreating all the things that were destroyed in 1965 war. The railway connectivity, the road connectivity, the border connectivities. And, and also to just bring, bring it into some perspective. We are watching the Ukraine war you know, on our screens. Russia is a great friend of India, etc. We all know. Also a great friend of Bangladesh because they stood by us in 1971. But, but let me tell you, with Bangladesh, our trade is more than with Russia, which is a much larger country. But we have a... Well, this, that's the point. So that's how important Bangladesh is to uh, us and I hope we are to them. I mean, it is an asymmetrical relationship to yeah. some extent. May I, can I just, can I come, I mean, I have, have many, many friends in, in India. I've been a journalist for really many years than I would like to admit. But truly, I have been on this, you know, like, what, track two relationship. But in Delhi, you know much more about Karachi and Lahore and Rawalpindi than you know about Dhaka. That's a point. That's it's a, point. a very I, important I, I point. I, I In can, Delhi, I, Dhaka doesn't exist that much. I mean, it is changing. It is changing. But, you know, when I meet uh, uh, intellectual in Delhi, he or she quotes, uh, you know, Iqbal or uh, Faiz Ahmad Faiz so casually. But I have seldom seen uh, them quoting Tagore or Nazrul. Because it is so far so, away. Yes. Mahfuz, you must understand that Delhi is a Punjabi city. <laughs> and that, and, and well, most of the people who came and settled in Delhi came from that part. Now well, we have first, an Adda. What we Bengali call well, an Adda. 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 For Adda. 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 our partner city Chakrabarti, is Delhi. <laughs> I've seen this. I'm sorry uh, that I'm interjecting. Please. And I completely concur with what you have said. I, I agree and too. that's why, I yes, I too. wanted to, you know, lay the land and, you know, tell a lot of people. I'm not saying that people don't know. I will not. <laughs> presume but it's right we love Faiz Ahmed Faiz yes we love Ahmed Faraz yes what about Nazrul and Tagore Tagore I mean I don't want to go into it but the point <laughs> is it's not it's not about the people it's not about Delhi you find this with people who are in positions of power you know who can influence decisions no, I, I even say, the media what I I'm say. trying to say is that we are a very important neighbor in fact your relationship with Pakistan is going nowhere so make your relationship with Bangladesh go everywhere. And on that note, if I may quickly, I won't take more than <laughs> one minute, that I'm so happy that in this 50-year journey, if you compare Bangladesh and Pakistan today, I'll just give you two or three figures which will tell you the, what is the difference today. Bangladesh exports about, let's say, $42, $45 billion of goods uh, 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 annually. Do you know how much Pakistan exports a much larger country today? 26 billion. It will open your eyes. This is where we are. What is the GDP of Bangladesh and what is the GDP of Pakistan today? So I, I agree that Bangladesh is one of our, the fastest growing countries that we have. Let, can I intervene yeah, by please, supplementing it? Yeah, sorry, sir. No, no, I just want to add to what Ambassador Chakravarti and Mahfuz by, are both saying, but I want to come at it in a slightly different way. In my role as agent provocateur for the evening, <laughs> which a Bengali must be, otherwise we are, we are wasting our DNA, which is hardwired into us. So t this is my Bidrohi moment uh, for the evening. Now, let me, let me tell you how Bangladesh, since we're in this sort of Bangladesh-India bhai-bhai kind of number this evening, how Bangladesh has actually helped break a few myths 
or for the Bengali. And here I know I'm stepping into very, very hot water. <laughs> it doesn't translate as well as Gorom Jol, but in very hot water. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you how, because one, a, a friend of mine in Dhaka, I won't name him because he'll be deeply embarrassed because this is being beamed all over the world, uh, and he'll be held to account for that. He told me something very, very interesting and very brutally simple. He's saying that, you know, Shudhi, uh, the Bengalis of India have a state, the Bengalis of Bangladesh have a country. And it begins with that. I, I know he said it tongue in cheek just to provoke a, con a response from me, but let me take it a step further. There have been these stereotypes that Bengalis of my generation, of your generation, gentlemen, and our forefathers and foremothers' generations four or five times ago, ever since 1857 happened. We've been battling this, this, this voodoo, hoodoo kind of thing that Bengalis are no good at battling. We don't have martial prowess. We have marital prowess, but not martial prowess. <laughs> so I mean, we are just bad fighters, so on and so forth, right? Even though there was such a thing called Bengal Lancers in the Bengal Regiment. Let that be. Now, in India, people forget that the first chief of air staff of India was Air Marshal Subroto Mukherjee. Let that pass. Let that pass for a moment that we had a general chief of the army staff called General Shankar Rai Choudhury, who I count as a mentor and a friend. In Bangladesh, this argument doesn't exist. You know, 90% of the people in Bangladesh in the Army, Navy, and Air Force are Bengalis. Yes. I mean, they're doing perfectly well defending their country. You know, they're flying fancy jets and, fancy, you know, driving fancy frigates on the seas in the Bay of Bengal, and they drive, all, and the land forces are pretty, pretty good, I'm told, in, in relative terms. In, in India, we are forever battling this sort of stereotypical attitude that Bengalis are no good at business, even though we forget the gentleman who used to be called Dwaki by his good friends, Dwarkanath Tagore. Uh, who used to also, he set up a bank, he used to export opium to China along with the Brits, his friends in, 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 in the British Indian Empire. But let that be. Now, Bengalis are no good at business. Now, you tell Bangladesh that. You tell Bangladeshis that, right? Uh, one of the fastest growing economies in Asia and the world. I just gave the example of how it is the second largest garment exporting business in the world. I see people driving around in Porsches and Lamborghinis in Dhaka, ruining my sleep every day, especially the weekends. You know, and uh, you know, the only quiet time in Dhaka is between 2 a.m. and 5.15 a.m. when the first Azan happens, right? Now, you tell this country that has come of age, come way of age, is now grown up and ready to run and is running, that they're not good at business. What do you think they'll tell you? They'll ask you to, uh, to speak French. They'll ask you to bugger off. You know, so there are these stereotypes that Bangladeshis, Bengalis have broken for themselves, for the Bengalis at large, and for the world. I know I'm being provocative, perhaps needlessly here, but I'm doing it to make a point that there are some arguments that hold true uh, as stereotypes against the Bengalis and against the Bangladeshi people, which I think are also well past the sell-by date. And I think we should acknowledge where we are now. You wanted to come in. Uh, yes, I, I mean, <clears throat> several years ago, I wrote a piece about India-Bangladesh relationship, in which I wrote that in India, India has only two neighbors, China and Pakistan. Rest of us are just geographic entities to be tolerated if we do, the, we do some misdeed and to be patronized if we are good boys. But we are not neighbors. What, I'm, what I dramatized was that we are not given that seriousness. Things have changed. At least with Bangladesh, things have changed dramatically. So I appreciate that. I congratulate Indian foreign uh, policy directors for that. But I'm looking at the future. I come back to my uh, earlier point that ba Bangladesh and India can forge a neighborly relationship which can be exemplary in the world. And I'm looking forward to that. To, to ach achieve that, as I said, you have to understand us, what makes us tick, who we are, what are our cultural heritages. And here I would just like to tell this audience that the land of Bangladesh today had, has had 400 years of Buddhist supremacy. It had 200 years of Hindu supremacy. And it had four, 500 years of Muslim supremacy till the British came. So we are the proud inheritors of all these three magnificent civilizations and their values and their cultures. We incorporated all of it. But obviously, it may differ from what your perspective of Bangladesh is. Look at us as an inheritor of all these three. 
as I again as repeat that we are 80% Muslims and yet we are secular. Therefore, take us to be what we are. Don't stereotype us that, oh, my, this is not Bengali, this is, uh, um, uh, are they becoming fundamentalists? Are they going uh, in the Pakistan way? We are not. We are proud Bangladeshis and we want our good friendship with India. My last point is that India and China, you are big powers, you have your own perspective to the world. Please don't pull us into your rivalry. We need India definitely as a very good friend. We also need China for our development purposes. If we are sucked into this rivalry, it will harm both India and Bangladesh. You need us to grow and prosper. Yeah. Ambassador Chakraborty, do you want to weigh in on that? I mean, there seems to be, of course, the points that he made. Uh, somewhere, geopolitically, even, you know, uh, so far as policies are concerned, do you think that there has to be a major, not just cosmetic surgery, but, you know, one has to take a scalpel and perhaps do a proper surgery? Because, you know, there are several things here which have come up, and today we are celebrating 50 years of it. This whole perception that uh, Mahfuz Bhai was speaking about, would you like to weigh in on this? If there have to be corrective measures, why is it that they are not being corrected? Well, they're certainly being corrected. So that is not, as, as he himself acknowledged, we've moved on from those stereotypes. But you know, you can't drive out stereotypes from the minds of people. You know, they, they do remain among the common people. But those who deal with these relationships perfectly understand where we are and how, how to go forward. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gone forward, to be honest. And as far as China is concerned, I perfectly understand as a diplomat with 40 years experience, that countries play one country off against the other. That is normal in international politics, and we expect China to do that. And we are playing the same game in our neighborhood. But then China has deeper pockets than us somehow, so maybe we are a little behind that. So China offers a lot of money, and let, us, let me not get into more controversial areas, but certainly that is going to happen, and that's the reality. But today, where we are with Bangladesh, is, is, you know, million, you know, years away from where we were, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And we are all witness to what is happening today. I, I can tell you that when I was there, we started the first train from Dhaka to, uh, to Kolkata and vice versa. Today, there are a couple of trains with many more frequencies. The waterways that connect, there are 54 rivers that connect India and Bangladesh trans-border rivers flowing fr from India into Bangladesh. We are trying to revive the waterways with lots of aid and whatever we can within our resources because waterways are the cheapest modes of transport. At a time when, let's say 100 years ago, 70% of people and goods moved only on waterways in that part of the world in the, because of the delta and so many rivers. Today only 2-3% goes, rest is on road and rail, but we are connecting all the railways. There was a there was a bit of an infrastructure problem about a broad gauge and small gauge, but that all been sorted out. So today we, we are in, on a different wicket altogether. And the last point that he mentioned about Buddhism, uh, there are some lovely Buddhist sites in Bangladesh that you should visit. I'm afraid not many people are aware of it, which is a different matter, but those who study history, those who study different countries will know that Moinamoti and Paharpur famous Buddhist sites in Bangladesh. So I would rest there because I can keep on talking about these. Can I, can I jump in just because the gentlemen have avowedly said, both of them, that they want to avoid controversial matters here. So me as a self-appointed controversial creature, can I just jump in and make one point which is germane to both Bangladesh and India in an absolutely explosive nature? And no, it is not religion, it is climate change. Can I just introduce that for a minute? Where Bangladesh, which we don't realize, and east, the eastern aspect of India, we don't realize very easily because we don't look at Sundarbans beyond it being a repository of tigers and, and, and you know, uh, mangrove forests, for instance, or wild honey. But that is the laboratory, ladies and gentlemen and friends, of climate change, which we are facing in South Asia as we speak. Uh, water levels are rising in Bengal, in Bangladesh. Uh, populations every year when the storm tides come and they recede, large, vast numbers of people keep moving northwards. Now, the only way, to my mind, that can be, uh, that can be prevented or stalled or slowed 
to use a more moderate term, is by investing in climate change, climate change economics, climate change politics, climate change socioeconomics, climate change everything. Otherwise, you're looking at a simple situation where migration will not be driven by religion. Migration will be driven by climate change, and there's nothing that we can do about it. So I will say again, if there, we don't work together on this, you are looking at an explosive and implosive situation in Bangladesh, which will lead to an implosive situation all across northeastern India and eastern India, and in fact, uh, one of the most densely populated pockets of the Indian subcontinent. So I would like to submit that in climate change cooperation lies the absolution of the subcontinent, a vast area of it. In Bangladesh's economic success and socio-political and economic success lies absolution not just for Bangladesh, but also for India. I would like to introduce this. I'm not sure whether this would be interpreted as controversial, but I think this is necessary. We yeah. cannot shy away from this. Not yeah. at all controversial, and I'm very glad you, you brought it up. This is an existential threat, if you like. And in addition to that, I would like to also add, while totally endorsing Shudeep's position, that, you know, the Rohingya crisis. Bangladesh received about 1.1 million Rohingyas driven out of Myanmar. And we opened our doors to it. Germany took 1 million Syrian refugees. We took 1.1 million Rohingya refugees. And look at that economic difference between Germany and Bangladesh. We are trying to look after them. So here again, we need Indian uh, help. We need global assistance. But Sudip's point about climate change challenges are very, very real. And here, perhaps, is the chance to build that bilateral relationship through the assistance and both technological, intellectual, you know, climate mitigation, adaptation, and all these things, India and Bangladesh can perhaps, not perhaps, must work together and again set an ex example of uh, good neighborly relations. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, Ambassador Chakrabarty. Well, after, climate yeah. change, since he introduced it, it is a, a very relevant issue for all of us and it has impacted on many things, including the the rivers that we have in terms of less water flow than glacial uh, melting, etc. But additionally, the demographic change on both sides, so many, the rise in population and, and water intensive agriculture. We all want to become food, there's food security in mind. So we are all growing rice on both sides. And that is sucking up so much of water. It wasn't there like that before. And hence the water, the, the consumption has gone up, you know, thousands, millions of times. And so that is also impacted on, and on the other hand, climate change is reducing the water flow. And hence, if we have sea rise, for example, if, if we don't control it, I, I, I would say one third of Bangladesh will go underwater, like India's coastline will go underwater. Right. Not one we've third, uh, but quite uh, a large, quite a significant uh, part. Uh, <laughs> we've completely, You're going to frighten everybody. Yeah, uh, we've completely lost time, I mean, lost sight of time because it was so riveting, the conversation. But I think we have to keep time. So uh, any questions that you would like to uh, ask the panelists, uh, the guests, then perhaps you can. Please raise your hand and a mic will come to you. Someone? Koi mic de dije, please. You'll have to choose. I got the mic first. <laughs> so. Uh, my question is to Mr. Mahfuz and then to all of you. Uh, I am from Assam. I am an Assamese person. So I get, I, I don't understand it, but I get that there's a lot of anti-Bangladeshi uh, sort of sentiment in Assam. In my, in my parents' and generation, even in my generation, I'm surprised with that. I understand that it's coming with some sort of linguistic chauvinism, this xenophobia to say. So what would be your reaction to it? What, I mean, uh, I don't understand it fully why it's there. But it's there. It's very much real. So what would be your... This is one of the very unfortunate developments that are taking place in South Asia. You know, identity politics, ethnic-based politics, religion-based politics, which is, you know, which is actually spewing hatred and misunderstanding. What is happening in Assam, again, is rooted to, you know, um, migration, to, to, you know, othering people who have been settled there for a long time. Uh, it is happening in South Asia, unfortunately, and I think we should all, we all need to guard against it. There is no, I mean, such, such development of hatred 
can only lead to violence and only lead to more tragedies. I think, Sudeep, as a, would you like to add to this? Well, I, uh, my friend, Apni uh, <laughs> sir. So, uh, I would like to address my friend and just say that, you know, it, as Mahfuz Bhai uh, alluded to it, in a very gentle manner, uh, as I've demonstrated my ungentle characteristics this evening, let me carry on in that vein. I think there is a, it, it's very briefly, I can explain why your parents' generation is uptight about or upset about migration, as it should be. Uh, because, after all, the Assam that they knew, and here, let me not provoke you further or your or your Ahumya, you know, brothers and sisters further by saying Assam hasn't been too gentle itself on the Mizos and on the Nagas and on the Khasis and the Garos and the Boros. Uh, you know, I think rebellion has happened in Assam administered territories simply because of the same paternalistic impulses that Assam attributes to New Delhi, for instance. But here I'm just throwing something in. The reason behind your parents' uh, attitude towards what is called IBI, illegal, illegal Bangladeshi immigrant. Let me just say it outright. And they use the word Mia, which is ironical, because Mia is a term of friendship and endearment in Eastern Bengal and among that community. In Northeastern India, it's used as a pejorative term, which is, which is truly a tragedy. Now, that's happened on, on, on account of migration. Uh, not just in Assam, my friend. Uh, it's happened in... I'm from West Bengal. I'm a Calcutta, Kolkata boy. Now, Kolkata changed because of events which were tragic and cruel and barbaric, which lies in our past, which changed the characteristic of Bengal and Kolkata completely. It turned Tripura from a, a, a Tripuri state into a 70% Bengali state. These are true things. These are factual, right? You can't get away from this history. Similar things happen in Assam. But I think the... The, the sense of alienation and anger began to happen simply because, you know, that classic thing about they're taking our jobs away, they're taking our livelihoods away. Ergo, there mustn't be very good development in Assam. Let me throw it back at you, right? And then the anger builds, and then the student movement happens. Then 1983, Nelly happens. Then the student movement grows. It goes into a full-fledged rebellion. And then they, the rebels go all over the place. And then India and Bangladesh relationship improves, and who hands over... Ulfa leadership into to India very mysteriously, Bangladesh. So, you know, I mean, it's all very gray, my friend. Let's not get into black and whites and binaries of religion and communities in we this. Have, but it's do very, very gray. It, do approach it with understanding. Indeed, indeed. We have look, time I for just I one just question. want to make one yeah. small point that, look, migration is not, you know, hasn't come from Mars. We wouldn't be here if the first humans hadn't migrated out of Africa. So migration is natural. We have to deal with it. Of course, there has been migration and including illegal migration. I must say that. We have the data. We all have the data. You just look at Bangladesh's census. You will know how many Hindus have migrated from, from Bangladesh. It is there on the record. So that's our Hi. Uh, so yeah, I have one the more question. Yeah, yeah, I have the mic over here. So I was, uh, you know, I run a media company. And, uh, you know, it's a, uh, one, I've just come from Manipur. And one of the things I feel is there is, a, as uh, Sir was uh, attributing, there is a lack of good news coming out of the region. So, you know, they say good, bad news travels fast, good news takes a stroll. But probably Bangladesh, this is the first time I've heard that, you know, there's Buddhism in Bangladesh and there's so much of, uh, you know. 400 there, years. Yeah, so that needs to come out a lot more than only the, you know, uh, communal strife and only the, you know, the, the negative news. Probably, and I use your words, sir, to throw it back to uh, you, <laughs> that uh, Bangladesh is not doing enough to do yeah, correct I PR in terms of bringing out the positive aspects of Bangladesh. The only aspects of Bangladesh that is coming out is, uh, you know, Islamophobia, communalism, and all these kind of aspects which is the world is hearing. You are absolutely right. I mean, uh, uh, all I can say is that uh, we, should, we should do more. I mean, definitely. And on that note, thank you very much for being a wonderful audience and a thank you to all of you. Uh, you know, we've actually uh, spent more time, yeah. I, I would like to repeat my thanks to JLF for organizing this, otherwise I, I wouldn't get a chance to speak about Bangladesh to all of you. I join you in that. Thank you, Pinak, Ranjan Chakravarti, Mahfuz Anam. Sudeep Chakravarti and Sudha Sadanan. We would also like to thank Sakal Media Group for their support. 
We've got books of Sudeep and he's going to be signing. So if you have copies, it's right here by the book signing area. You can just queue up and Sudeep will be there.